Um, okay, so hello. Welcome to uh, all of you. I know most of you. Um, I know some of you I haven't met because the first day was yesterday. So uh, hello and welcome to Instructional Technology. My name is Caitlin Cordova. I'm going to be your IFT or your tech coach. So any tech needs that you have, I'm here to support you. My office is in L100 for at least until October. And then once the library's done, I'll be located with them. So um, all the, the librarians, um, Ira and Aisha and I will all be housed in that one space to support your instructional needs, which is kind of cool. I also want to introduce Jacob Worth to you. He is our Promethean Education Consultant, and he is going to take the first half hour or so of our time together today, and then I'm going to wrap us up for some new School of Phoenix and professional learning news. Okay, so please welcome Jacob. Thank you. <laughs> uh, all right, so new panels. Uh, these are going to be hopefully life changing in a good way, much better than the TV monitors. However, I know there are some people that are stuck in their way. So if you want to continue teaching the way you've done before with the monitors, this can be just a monitor for you. You don't have to change, or you can take things very slowly. I'm going to go through a lot of things right now in a very short amount of time. So this presentation um, is available for you guys. There's also a lot of resources I've created, one page or short one to two minute videos on everything I'm talking about, plus extra stuff that you guys can always access to. And then Taylor will share my contact info and you can always reach out to me directly if you have any sort of problems or any questions. Or if you just want to brainstorm well, how you can take advantage of the panel uh, better. But jumping into things, uh, I guess I am Jacob. I'm the Promethean <coughs> consultant. I technically work for Promethean, so I don't get a badge to get into schools. But everything else I do is just 100% LCPS. I've uh, been doing this for the last two years while schools sort of get these new panels up and running. Um, and I was just going to say something I forgot, you know, fifth session. I don't remember everything anymore. All right. Uh, first thing is taking care of the panels. There's not too much you need to do, uh, but they are big, giant iPads for the most part. So when it comes to cleaning, you're going to see a whole bunch of finger smudges. When I'm standing at this angle, I can see all mine, and it bothers me, so I try not to look too much at it. But uh, to get those off, we recommend using like a microfiber towel. This is just like glasses wiper downer. I don't know if that's a technical term. But you can wipe those smudges. They should come right off. Uh, if you get anything a little sticky on there or something that doesn't come off with a dry towel, it's okay to spray the towel a little bit with water and get it damp to wipe down the, the panel. Uh, but the key is don't ever spray liquids directly on the panel. And that's because the bezel that goes around the edge, this little lip, that's what senses your touch. It's not actually the pressure on the glass. So if liquid gets in there, it can mess with the way things register. Um, for anyone that's been around for a while, uh, there is no calibrating when it comes to the touch. You don't have to touch little dots to make sure your finger is still off by three inches. Um, it should register right where you touch, right from the beginning as soon as you turn it off. Um, oh, another thing is you guys should be getting a tub of disinfectant wipes too. So if you have a whole bunch of people coming up to the panel and you want to get rid of all the germs, you can use those to wipe them down. They're just like Lysol wipes, but approved for the panel. Uh, there are a few things that you guys, I think, will have the option to check out from the library um, that come with the panel. One is the stylus pen. It's a nice looking thing to use. However, it is just a piece of plastic. It does not do anything special like the old, old boards where you only could use the pen. Uh, so if I just pull up a writing utensil, I can come in and just start writing. With the stylus, I can use either end of it. It doesn't matter. But it also doesn't do anything different that my finger won't do. Or the stylus that's part of your uh, computer or a little rubber tip at the end of a pen. All of those work great. Tennis ball works just as well. <laughs> Anything you want that's not going to scratch the glass, test it out, more than likely it will register. Um, we've also noticed that hair can register as touch on here. So you swing your hair around, it might change slides. Yeah, but, it happened last few seconds, so you were, you were that. Um, I guess while we're on that, while we're on that topic, um, I'm in Google Slides right now, which I know a lot of people use. Uh, Google changed their settings so the touch wouldn't automatically change slides. They want you to mean it when you want to change slides. So with Google Slides, you can't just do a little flick like this to change the slide. 
it's a drag input that you have to do. Um, something that you'll have to get used to so when you get back to your classrooms sometime this week or next, kind of just practice and get the hang of it. If, that, if you don't like doing that, you can just tap on your screen and hit these little arrows on the bottom, or you can still use a clicker plugged into your computer. But this is a little warning. Touch isn't broken, it's just it really wants to be used, wants you to meet when you use it. All right, back to the writing. So really lots of things work as touch on here, and you can have multiple things working at the same time. So you can have two students come up and write at the same time. You've actually got 15 points of touch. So you could write on it with all of your fingers, and if you can kick high enough, these are pretty high, but you can kick high enough to get all your fingers, half your toes, all registered at the same time. So lots of things work, lots of things at the same time. The kids were trying to do Oh yeah, for sure. Um, another thing you're gonna get with the panels, something you should be familiar with if you've been around, is the screen beam. It is already gonna be attached to the back. It's plugged into some inputs that are on the side of the panel. It's gonna be plugged into Touch 2 and HDMI 2, so there's two plugs. Um, just for troubleshooting wise, you can come over to the side and make sure things are working. It's also, that's the source we need to switch to to connect wirelessly. And I'll go through the steps in that um, in a bit. Some more inputs. These ones are on the back, back here, but they're facing the ground. So you have to look from underneath to get to them, but they're more than likely things you're not gonna need to use. Um, but I just put this up here to show you that there's probably a way to connect whatever you want. And then the last set of inputs, the easy to access ones right up front. You've got another HDMI, another USB touch, because this is another set of cords you'll probably get um, that you can plug in and hardwire a computer to the panel with. And we'll, again, we'll talk about that in a sec, but there's also a USB port here. So if you have a flash drive, that's the best way to save things and get them off the panel, put them on your computer to put them online for students. Again, something we'll talk a little bit more about in a minute or two. Uh, the buttons over on the side. So the nice thing about the panels is that um, they're ready to go as soon as you get them. As long as they're plugged in, you turn on the power, ready to roll. Um, when you hit the power button, if I just press it once, the panel's not off, it just puts it to sleep. So that's a good way to hide whatever you're doing. But if you want to bring it back, all you have to do is tap the screen and it'll bring it right back. If you do want to power it down for the day, press and hold for a couple seconds and it will power down. Uh, the other nice thing for those of you that have been around for a while and might have used the projectors, you do not have to worry about any bulbs burning out or anything. If you forget to turn off the panel, there's a built-in timer. Uh, it's usually set to about two hours where if you don't interact with the panel, it will shut down in two hours or it will go to sleep in two hours. Um, it's great for if you forget to turn it off at the end of the day. Uh, however, if you're somebody who doesn't interact with their panel a lot, so if I was just up here and clicking through my arrows to go through my presentation and I didn't touch the panel or do any buttons or anything, that sleep mode would activate. Um, it will give you a 60 second warning, so you'll see that pop up. If that pops up while you're presenting, no big deal, just tap the screen or have a student tap the screen and it will reset that two hour timer. If that timer pops up a lot for you and it's really annoying, Talk to Caitlin, she can change the setting for how long that goes. We just want to make sure that it's not turned off because then you should stay on all night, all summer, all weekend. Um, all right, moving on. Unified menu. This is how we navigate to everything. So I can hit this button, little flame button. It brings up our menu down at the bottom here. All of our apps, how to change sources is down there. But you can also pull up that menu just by clicking these little arrows that are on the sides and down at the bottom. So no matter where you're at, you can always access those. Volume buttons, pretty self-explanatory. The one nice thing about them is all you have to do is press one of the buttons once, and then you can adjust the volume with your finger if you want. You can also get to brightness here, change it based on the lighting in the room. Uh, there are speakers built into the panel, so as soon as you connect, sound will come out of these speakers, and they can get really loud. So even if you're in the gym and you turn the volume all the way up, people on the other end are going to hear it, for sure. And just be careful if you do have it all the way up, you're not you know, right next to it when it starts to play. Again, they can get real loud. The source button, if I hit that, it brings up my menu again and the different sources that I have. 
you should always see home and you should always see HDMI too, because that's the screen view. If you start plugging in other things, so if I plug my computer into these cords, a new source would pop up. But you should always see those two. Uh, another thing you guys uh, might be able to check out are there are remotes that come with the panels. They're okay. They're the borderline useful. Um, so the good news is most of the things that the remote can do, you can do directly on the panel. So power, volume, menu, source, that sort of stuff. Uh, they're very finicky. So I brought this from home. The thing is they are universal, so I could go to anyone's classroom and this remote would work on it. The freeze button will work to freeze your screen, but you can still do stuff to the actual Promethean board. So if you touch the board, your slide might go to the next one. You should see a little snowflake icon in the upper right corner of the screen when the screen is frozen. My computer up here, you just can't see what's going on. So if I unfreeze it now, I'll be on a new slide. See how finicky these are? There we go. So remotes, nah. But they, it might be an option for you guys to rent out if you think it would be useful. Is there a laser pointer on that? There is not. Um, also, laser pointers don't really show up on the, the screens. Very well, so just as a warning for that. Um, all right, connecting your computer. Same way as you did before. Uh, the only thing you have to do on the panel is hit either that source button or pull up the menu with one of the arrows, go to source and HDMI 2. That's what you'll do every morning, probably. You'll see the landscape picture that you've probably seen before. Just make sure you're connecting to the right screen beam. There will be a display name up on the screen. And then on your computer, hit Windows and K to bring up this menu. Find which one you want to connect to. Click on it. If it's your first time, there's that four-digit PIN number. You only have to do that the first time you connect to the panel. And then you should be good to go. The one extra step for the panels versus the monitors is there's going to be a little checkbox down here. After you've connected, this says allow mouse, keyboard, touch, and pen input. Make sure you check that box. Otherwise, these are just going to be a monitor again for you. You won't be able to control anything. But once that's checked, you have full control of your computer with your finger. Uh, three quarters of the problems or questions I get are solved by that little checkbox. I forget to check it sometimes because uh, the good news is once you've checked it, like I've connected to this panel now, I've checked it. Next time I connect, it will stay checked. But if I go to a different panel, I got to make sure I check that again. So there's been multiple times where I've gone to school and done this, and it's like, I don't know what's wrong. My own advice, different box. So just be aware of that. And then a couple options when it comes to wireless. Only one computer can be connected at a time, so make sure you disconnect when you're done or you leave the class. Um, this one's not a big deal anymore. You can use multiple monitors and should still be fine. But as you guys know from previous, the Chromebooks cannot connect through the screen. So the ways to connect the student devices, you can hardwire it. So you should get this cord. They'll be meshed together, but it's an HDMI cord and a USB touch cord. Looks like this. You can plug them in up front here, plug the other ends into a computer, and then go to source, and there'll be a new source that pops up. Click on that, and then you'll have full range. The good news about you guys having to wait to get these panels is there is a USB-C port on the side, too. So you will get a USB-C cord. You can plug that in here, plug the other end into your computer or a Chromebook, which is nice because Chromebooks actually have USB-C ports. They don't have HDMI ports anymore. And that one cord will do everything. But you can see, touch here, everything with one port and charge for that matter. So USB-C is a great way to go. I'd recommend that over these cords. Um, but the other thing is you can stay connected wirelessly. They can be connected hardwired, and then you can just toggle between yours and theirs. So if you co-teach or have a presenter come in, you can do that too. Um, <coughs> there is something in the works. Yeah. I'm new. So is your computer right now connected uh, wirelessly? Wireless, okay. yeah, to the so. screen feed. Mm -hmm. And then um, in the resources. Sorry, and what you're seeing on there is what you're seeing there too? Yes, right now I'm in duplicate mode, but you can also extend your screen. Yep. So I could extend and have this be the presentation and you know, my 
seating chart over here, and the touch will still work just fine on Extend. I'm almost always in Extend. We just had some problems earlier that went back to duplicate. Um, there are some things in the works right now that should be available relatively soon for students to be able to connect to the panels wirelessly with their Chromebooks. Um, it is called Screen Share. This is just going to be an option that you guys can take advantage of if you want to. So um, it's not available yet, but Screen Share would be an extension that they download <clears throat> onto Chrome. And then for you guys, you'll be up at the panel. You'll, it's already on our unified menu. You can click Screen Share. You get an activation code. So they would have to type in this code to be able to display on the panel. But even that, they don't, they're don't. they not going to automatically have their screen put up here. You're going to see a list of all of your students once they've typed in that code. And then you can select which ones you want to display. You can actually display up to four student devices at once on here. Um, so if you want to watch four soccer games, you yes, you can connect. Mm -hmm. I would, I do, I do want to say it's not the best way to share video. Yeah. If you want a student to share a video they made, I would still say hardwire is better than going through the screen share. It's mostly for like if you want them to present something they made in Google Slides or show mm -hmm. a PDF or something. Great for that. Um, video wise, hardwire or the screen views are still great for if you want to do it on your computer. But yes, theoretically, you could put up four soccer games and hope for the internet to work right now. Um, just a, a few warnings when it comes to this, um, and there will be a best practice sheet that will be handed out to you guys, is that students type their names in when they type in that code, so they can type in anything. So sort of set that expectation. If you don't trust the class to do that well, don't let them do this. But if you see someone type in something inappropriate up top, you can hit a little X and take their name away. So this is just an option that will be available for you guys soon. Um, and then if you do think that would be useful for your class, uh, talk to Caitlin. I can come back in and show you guys exactly how that works. Too. But just wanted to give you guys a little preview. OK, time, 10 minutes? Or did I go too long on that stuff? No, you're great. You got Perfect. 15 minutes. Oh, wow. Yeah. Cool. Then, uh, next thing I'm going to talk about are, oh, sorry, are there any questions? I'm kind of skipping over questions. I want to get through. OK. So that's sort of like the, I don't know, the not as fun stuff. But there are apps built directly into the panel that you can use. Uh, you don't need your computer. You don't need internet to use these. Um, it came in useful this morning when the internet went down. I was able to still do a few things. Uh, but those are our essential apps. So the essential apps, let me just get through some of these quick to show you which ones. <clears throat> Anyways, the essential apps include whiteboard, capture, annotate, and then there's a timer and a spinner app that are useful. So the first one I'll show you is whiteboard. It is on the unified menu here. You can go to whiteboard. We were playing last time with this. So this is what you're going to see when you open it up. Just a blank canvas to work on, take notes. Um, you've got a toolbar over here on the left. And since I have extra time, I'll show you guys this one. I like it on this side because this is where I usually present from. But if you're left-handed or like it on the other side, I can come up to these three dots at the top. And one of the options is toolbar position. So I can click that and push the toolbar over that side. So if you had two people working, you could actually just send it back and forth. Um, as for the tools on this, a good chunk of them are stuff you find anywhere. You've got your selector tool. You've got a pen. If you click on your pen and then select it again, you can change the width. And then you can just start writing. Again, no calibrating or anything. Highlighter, same thing. But see-through ink. Colors, palette for more colors. Big eraser, I can go and erase specific parts. Panel screen with an eraser is erase all. And then down at the bottom, there are undo and redo buttons. You never lose anything. Common tools you probably find in a lot of stuff. Some of the extra features built into this include some measurement tools. If I click this little top half of a burger, I can click on a ruler and bring that into my whiteboard. I can move this around. 
You can also change the size of things in here like you would on a phone, like zooming into a picture, just do a little pinch and extend or shrink, change the size, and you can interact with it. So I can click on my pen and then on the top or the bottom of the ruler, and I can draw straight lines. Make a quick name and pick that toe. Hold that up. So you can interact with it, change the size. There are other options in here, including protractors that um, are useful, and there's different ways to interact with it. If you see yourself using these, I'd say go in and play with them. There's some cool things you can do or ask me later. But for sake of time, I want to make sure I get through everything else. Um, moving up the toolbar, you don't want to have just a blank screen. Come to this pound sign or hashtag sign. This is how you can change the background. So there's a few templatized things you can use, like writing lines. And default, it makes it this light blue color for some reason. But I can go back in there. And these four colored bars can change the color of the line. So I usually just choose black so you can see it, actually. There's also graph paper in here. Um, our music teachers love this one. Um, just a few different options. And when you're in here, you can also do that pinch to zoom and change the size of the lines, including the graph paper. And you can scroll. You've got unlimited amount of space. Um, you can also change it from a white background to a red. I, I would always, almost always keep the white if you want to do like a Halloween themed day or whatever. So that's the pound sign. Change the background. Go back to normal. Mm -hmm. Below that, this little mountain range. If I click on that, it brings me to some pre-built charts and templates that might be useful. Mind maps, tables, a T-chart, a Venn diagram. There's even a periodic table on here. But if you see one that you want to use, just click on it, and it brings it directly into the whiteboard. And you can start you can have two students come in and start filling it in. And then if I change the size of that picture, my writing will adjust with it. So you can do fill in this T-chart, you know, shrink it, move it off to the side, focus on something else, and then bring this back in. Or you could just scroll to a new space and do something. And you can scroll this way, do another thing, and then you could scroll. You could do that forever. Unlimited amount of space. However, if you do that, you notice you probably get lost. But when I'm scrolling, if you see in the top right corner, a little map appears. So I can see where I have things. So I've got another scribble this way. And this black box means I have an image, which is my key card. So unlimited amount of space that hopefully you can't get lost in. Um, if I hit erase all, it's going to get rid of all of my annotations. So even my scribbles that were off to the side, those are gone now. If you want them back, you can always hit undo bring them back, but just be aware if you hit erase all, they'll all go away. Um, but it won't get rid of any images or charts. If I want to get rid of that, go to the selector tool, just tap on it, and a little trash can appears. You can delete that out. Um, one more feature that I haven't shown any other sessions, but since we have a little bit of time, there is a dual mode here. So you can always have multiple students working on the panel, but if I click down for my own sake. If I hit dual mode, it shrinks this main toolbar and now it puts a toolbar on either side of the screen. So you can have two students up here and they have a little bit more choice of what they're doing and they have two different tools working at the same time. It also freezes the screen so they can't scroll away on each other. So just another extra feature. All right. Um, when it comes to this whiteboard and the other tools, they're sort of like one-off activities. Uh, you can save anything you do on this whiteboard, but because the panel is its own entity, it's going to save it to the panel. You're not going to be able to put it online for your students. Um, if you do something on here that you really need to put online for students or want to, the only way to do that right now is to have a flash drive, plug it in up front, hit the three little dots at the top, and you can export it to your flash drive as a PDF. A screenshot would be whatever showing. Canvas would be if I had stuff off to the sides. Put it on the flash drive, put it on your computer, and put it on there. Um, the recommendation is if you know you want to create something in this white space and put it online later, open up a different app on your computer. Something like Active Inspire, you can then 
use your finger still to draw things and do stuff, but because you opened it through your computer, you can save it to your computer just to eliminate that step. Um, you'll notice on, above those it says export PWB, that's Promethean whiteboard. So that's for teachers who move classroom. If you create something on here that you want to use in a different classroom on a different panel, you can export it as a PWB, a Promethean whiteboard, put it on the flash drive, go to another class, plug it in, and you can open up that whiteboard and still be able to maneuver things around and have everything changed. So flash drive, if you do want to take things off, is the best bet. Um, all right. Another one-off sort of activity is the annotate tool. So again, on our unified menu, if I click annotate, you guys saw me use this, you get this toolbar that floats. And now I can write, highlight, color things that I want. So if I pull up a blank worksheet or I pull up a picture and I want somebody to highlight things, you know, go to my highlighter. Make sure you notice that. That's what annotate is for. But as soon as I close this out, all of those are going to disappear. So if you want to save your annotations, the only way to save things and the best way to get things onto the panel is come back to a unified menu and hit capture. Captured will take a screenshot of whatever is showing at that moment. So it could be a PDF, a worksheet, a document camera, whatever. Now I can crop to whatever I want within that picture, hit done, click open and whiteboard, and it brings that picture into my whiteboard now. So I've created a few activities where I just went to Google Images and took captures of different things. And then students can come up here and drag those pictures in different categories. Um, but the best part is that it saves it to the panel. So I go back to where my charts and templates were, that mountain range, and down below that where it says gallery, all of my screenshots that I've taken will be saved here. So it can be images like this of notes you took. It could be graphic organizers that aren't in the charts and templates. You can access those whenever on this panel. So because you use that tool, that's actually on the Promethean, not on your computer. Right. right. It yes. has to be downloaded. Mm -hmm. So if you don't want to have that situation, you will probably have to open up the Active Inspire and do the same thing yes. rather than using that. You know, mm -hmm. Unless you, yeah. Unless you want to use the flash drive and get things off, yeah. the recommendation for the most part is create your activities on your computer. This is, again, for in-class sorts of things or one-off. Kind of um, okay, finishing up, there's a whole bunch of other things I could show you guys, but I want to make sure I get these ones in. The last two apps are the spinner and the timer apps. They're not on our unified menu, unfortunately, so to get to them, you have to go into your locker first, where all these other apps are stored, but you'll see timer and spinner in there. Click on it, timer comes up. Let's go to, I've been playing with it a little bit, so let's go to, to timer. You get this floating stopwatch. You can navigate and do things, so I can still draw and do stuff. You can have an activity up here and put the timer up. Um, I can go full screen. I think I accidentally hit the X. <clears throat> yeah, full screen timer. Um, you can adjust the time for whatever you want. Hit play, and there would be an alarm that goes off when you're done. I want to hit zero. We haven't done it yet. So you guys can hear the alarm. And that's an example of how loud this can get. That was less than half um, of the volume capabilities. All right, so you have timer. You can also click this little drop down arrow and change it to a stopwatch if you want, or to a clock. So you can do it uh, where students would still have no idea what time it is, or go to this little gear here. You can change it to a digital clock to make it easy on them. <laughs> and you can add up to four of these on screen at once, and each one can be changed from a timer to a stopwatch device. If you have four timers going at the same time, one timer and a stopwatch going, whatever. And I always uh, liked this for standardized testing. We could have a clock and a timer for whatever section they're working on in one spot that they can look at. All right. And then the last thing I want to talk about is my favorite one, and that's the spinner. So again, you have to go back to your menu and into the locker to get the spinner. It's going to be very similar in function to the timer, but instead of a stopwatch, you get this wheel that floats around. And again, you can navigate and go to different places. Full screen, just so you guys can see a little better. But you can spin it like it's a real wheel. Uh, there's a few pre-built ones like this 
these colors. So if I hit this drop down menu, you'll see other ones like alphabet and colors, but you can create your own spinners. You can title it, you can put your class roster in, you know, A days, block one, add as many students as you need, up to 60. Hopefully, you will never need more than 60. Hopefully, you don't need 60. Um, but you can then save it. You can save it, and it will be saved to the panel, and you can access it the next day, a month down the line. It'll always be there. All you do is hit this little drop down menu, and it'll be in this list. Um, and once you've made one, you can always come back and edit it too. So if a student leaves your class, just delete them out. Or a student gets added, just come and add them in at the bottom. And if you were crazy enough to let them do this, they can even select what color they want to be on the spinner. But you'll be able to spin it, take the place of if anyone used popsicle sticks before. Uh, but the nice thing is with popsicle sticks, if you take someone's name, they saw you put their name off to the side, they're like, okay, I'm not getting called on again. Mm. There's a setting in these spinners, if I go to the little gear, select item once, if that's turned on, which it is, I can spin this and there's no chance it's gonna land on blue this time. It's actually gonna have to land on everything else before it lands on blue. So you have that on, you can call on people, everyone gets called on any cool amount of times and they're none the wiser that they're not gonna get called on, well, at least at the beginning, they might catch on eventually. But you can always turn that off and it will be completely random every time. And then, like the timer, you can add up to four of these on screen at once. Um, I like creating activities using these. Uh, I, in my session, one of my sessions on Monday for the PD day, I'm going to talk about using all these apps to create sorts of different activities, including I did one for like a Spanish class where it was their name here. I spun that, whoever landed on, they got to come up and spin the rest, and it was a verb, a tense, and a sentence, and then they had to write, or not sentence, a subject, and then they had to write a sentence. Um, and then with uh, earth science, there was two rock cycle spinners and they had to tell me how to go from one stage to the next. So there's a lot of cool things and you can do these in combination with um, different apps like the whiteboard. So you can put up a diagram of a picture, all the things that need to be labeled in a spinner, they can spin it and then write in all those things. So a lot of cool things you can do. Um, you have all the resources. You will have all the resources, all that stuff. And I know this was very condensed, but they're very easy to use. Once you go back and play with them, you'll learn a whole bunch of new things. But you can the nice thing is you can take it slow and do things one at a time. But other than that, if you have questions, you'll get my contact info. I am around to help in any possible way that I can. But other than that, thank you guys. And Caitlin's got a few more things. Um, okay, so just just a few more things to talk about. I'm going to mention stuff going on in our new My Learning Plan. It's called Professional Learning. I'm going to talk about a new Schoology tool, and I'm going to talk about new gradebook. Um, so first, I just want to draw everyone's attention to where all this information is stored. Jacob mentioned that the stuff is going to be available. All the stuff from today, including nuts and bolts, restorative language, and all of this information is going to be in the August retreat folder in our Schoology group. So we have, a, we have a whole folder called Professional Development. That's where you're going to find all the professional learning we do from this year, as well as um, professional learning. If you want a detailed description of just kind of how that works and how to sign up for stuff, you can come in here and watch a video on that. But just the, the quick intro to it is if you go to LCPS Go and you come to our staff resources, you're going to notice two new P buttons. And as you can see, I just touched it with my hair. It's that sensitive. <laughs> so please, please be careful if you, you have luxurious tresses. Um, so um, again, I'm going to go back to staff resources. You're going to see two P items, Power School Perform. That's our new evaluation software. That's September and October problems. So we're going to worry about that later. Um, professional learning is going to be where we're going to click to get into the professional learning catalog. So again, um, if I if I open it up and I come into my courses, this is going to be where I can search for things, especially if I want to sign up for stuff on um, Monday. So I'm just going to search general math and see what comes up. So um, you might notice a few things. If you see something that's called self-paced, most likely that's an asynchronous course you can complete on your own for points that you get credit for. So that's kind of cool um, to actually get points for your learning. 
But if you see an instructor-led thing, that's most likely something like this session or like Dr. Brewer's session where uh, you attend at a specific time and place. Um, if I click this pin button, that's going to pin it to my pinned courses. So if I see a bunch of stuff that I want to save but I don't necessarily want to sign up for, my pinned courses are going to show, if I keep scrolling, it should show up here somewhere. Required courses, recommended courses. They should be somewhere on this home screen, or if I go to courses, it probably makes more sense for them to be there. Um, my courses, I'm going to keep scrolling. Um, they, I promise you it is on here somewhere. <laughs> it's just been a long day. I apologize. Um, but there's a lot you can do in here. Let me know if you want me to come find you for individual support. I'm happy to do that. Second thing, which can be kind of exciting, um, Schoology, which is where we're going to have our classes, that's where we publish our content, um, has a new feature where if you add an assignment, you can actually add a type of assignment where students can draw and put text on directly in Schoology. So you don't have to take them out to like a one notebook or like a Google slide or like a, a worksheet. It's a tool that's embedded in Schoology for them to write on stuff. So let's say I create a, a worksheet or I have the human body or a driver's ed, just something. Um, I'm just gonna upload a sample PDF. Each student is gonna get a copy of this um, and they'll be able to write on it just with their fingers or mouse or whatever. So um, I can think of that as being very useful for, for math perhaps um, if you don't want them to have to go to a separate app. So again, if you want individual support, I'm happy to help you with that. Yeah. So if you already have stuff made, do I have to go and redo something to have that feature now? No. It, it should already be there. It, it should already be there. You might just have to click the, the button and okay. attach it. Yes. Yeah. That's a great question. And I love that you all are thinking ahead. Um, last thing I want to briefly touch upon, I'm going to pull up my Phoenix train environment just so I can show you all uh, the new gradebook view. So and again, feel free to pull up your own Phoenix if you would like, but I'm going to pull up, I think I was using Bill Knowles earlier. And Bill only teaches on B days. So we're going to pull up Bill's English 9 class. So seating chart, there's going to be no difference in attendance or any of the notifications you receive. This screen is all the same. The big thing that's going to be different, if, if you click the drop-down menu, you're going to see where it says new gradebook, and you're going to see classic gradebook. If I click classic gradebook, that's going to take me to the Phoenix that we all know and love. So this view should look familiar to you. The, the colors, the, um, you know, you have the new where you can just create a quick assignment, or if you click new, that creates a new assignment for you. Reports. Um, so th this standard view has not changed. That is there for you. However, um, the, the team responsible for this has pushed out a new user interface that has some additional features that you might find helpful. If you want to try using that version of Gradebook, I'm just going to click or hover over Gradebook, click the new Gradebook option. So I'm just going to I'm going to let you take a look at this for a sec, or maybe you're looking at your screen. Give you a little bit of wait time. So what things do you notice that might be different? Okay. So you can... The missing column. So missing is going to be one of those options you can toggle on and off, just like the classic gradebook. In fact, I'll, I'll go ahead and go to my options, and I will turn that off for you. Yeah. What other things might be different? The plus button. Big blue plus button. Is that how you would create a site? Yes. So I'm, I'm actually glad you all brought this up. If I want to add assignments, I'm going to click this big blue plus button and then click the add assignment button. I don't want to click the content button because adding content would just be like adding a PDF, a link. You can do all that in Schoology. Um, the purpose of Gradebook is to communicate grades home to students and parents. So I'm going to click on assignment and I'm going to have a couple tabs that pop up. I might give the assignment a name like chapter one. 
I can set my due dates. If I want to give it a unit, maybe this is part of unit three. It's kind of cool because the unit name is saved. So if, if you do stuff by unit, this could be very useful for you. Our grading categories are the same. So formative, um, summative, all that jazz. We have score types. So if you do percentage, raw score, all that stuff. Um, score types, keep your points in your max score the same unless you want to futz with how they're calculated. Other stuff, if I go into advanced settings, I can change the grading type to not for grading if it's formal formative. If I have a rubric, I don't think any of us have rubrics, but um, if I want to assign it to multiple grading periods, multiple classes. So if I teach the same section of multiple classes, this would be where I can assign that. And then over here, this is whether my students and parents see it or not. So if I want to not show it in portal, I'll just turn that off. You know, maybe I don't want them to see it yet. Standards, if you link your standards, which only CTE is required to do that, unless you want to link your standards, it's perfectly okay. I'm going to come back to the content thing. And then over here, this uh, three dot menu that you see, the snowman menu, um, I've got a couple options. One option is copy current assignment. So if you give uh, the consistent assignments per unit and you just want to copy, 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 copy to recycle assignments, this is a great tool for you because it'll literally copy all the settings. So I'm just going to click the copy button. And you can see it says copy of chapter one and it's it's kept all the settings the same. The other thing that's different between new and classic is this is where you'll delete something. So in classic gradebook, you have to click on the assignment. You get a drop down. You press the delete button. For here, you have to delete it from this little drop down menu. OK, I think we have one minute left. I want to show you two more cool things and then send you on your way. Any questions? So we have a choice this yeah. year to mm -hmm. which one we would use. And uh, you, you asked this year. I, I don't know how long that choice will last, but at least for this year, you have a choice between the two grade books. Um, first cool thing I want to show you, uh, if you're in grade book, you might see a little floppy disk or a magic wand in the upper right corner. If I right click that, I can turn on auto save. What autosave does is as you enter grades, you know how they normally turn red and then you have to click a button to save grades. But what happens if the internet goes out and like you can't save your grades? Autosave will save grades as you enter them. It'll also save assignments as you put in details. So you probably saw like a little um, like thing going on as I was editing the assignment. Anytime I make a change to it, um, it's going to trigger this little autosave thing to do something up here. So it should, it should just go and let me know if it's saved or not. The other cool thing I want to show you, when I go to enter grades, if I click on this first assignment under Bill, I've got the comment codes here. So I can add comment codes just by clicking on a button. If I hover over the comment code, it tells me what the comment code is for. So like if it's X, that's exempt, uh, zero, missing. But score history, I think, is the most valuable thing. Um, if you enter a score once, it's going to create a time, date, and person who entered it record. So this is really useful if you have a co-teacher who has access to your gradebook. You can see who's entered what and when. This also could be useful if you entered the wrong score. You need to go back or um, we have retakes. You can enter the retake grade. You can write them in a, a little note in the notes column. Um, the kids, can the kids see the score? History? I don't think so. I think that's only internal. They can see public notes and then private notes is for you. Again, if, if you do not want to use this, that is OK. We can go back to classic gradebook for our, the one that we're used to. Um, but I, I encourage you to play around with both. Whatever assignments you put in will flip flop back and forth seamlessly. It's just you won't have autosave, score history, um, units. You won't have those three things in the classic gradebook. So uh, friends, I value your time. I, I know you have action team meetings to get to, possibly. But uh, please let me know if you have any questions. And uh, thank you for being here. Yeah, if you have any questions, we'll be here. Thank you.